Jeff uh, gained fame uh, in the 1980s, really, when he was uh, among the first economists, if not the first to say the 10% GST idea probably wouldn't uh, be so good economically, and he proposed 7%. Uh, then he did something more outrageous, which uh, was when he said that the Toronto housing market was way overvalued. In, this was in 1989, and he forecasted a 25% drop in prices. Uh, now, homeowners were outraged, banks were outraged, which was uh, awkward since Jeff worked for a bank at the time. <laughs> but soon he was uh, proven right and got a promotion out of it. In 1992, Jeff became chief economist of uh, CIBC. And, uh, uh, coincidentally, also became a Golden Mail guest columnist uh, for four years, writing ahead of the curve. Uh, Jeff went on to earn 10 number one rankings uh, in the Bre Brendan Woods Annual Survey of International Equity and Fixed Income Investors. Uh, so that's a great badge of honor in the international markets world. He, uh, into, this, into this decade, he gained international acclaim for his understanding of global energy markets. Uh, of course, he uh, made many headlines when he forecast $100 a barrel uh, oil in 2005, and he was quickly proven right. Uh, and then he went on to say $200, and uh, I think he still stands by that, and he'll, uh, he'll uh, give his explanation for that tonight. In fact, he's uh, suggested we all start to get comfortable with $26 a liter gas uh, prices. So get your, get your head around that. Last April, Jeff, uh, Jeff resigned from CIBC after 20 years on Bay Street to focus on uh, on his book uh, and future books as well as on speaking to uh, audiences both at home and portion of, uh, of abroad and I should say fortunately here at home we're privileged to uh, now listen to Jeff Rubin. Jeff. It's not that we're going to rewrite an ad boy. Not even close. There's 165 billion barrels of oil in the Alberta tar sands. There may be as much or even more in the Orinoco tar sands in Venezuela. And if we run out of that, there's billions more in oil shale, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, in fact, all around the world. But what we have run out is the oil that you can afford to burn. Because the kind of prices that are going to be needed to lift, for example, 4 million barrels a day out of the Canadian oil sands, as forecast boldly by the International Energy Agency, are the very same prices <coughs> that are going to take you right off the road. Not only are they going to take you right off the road, but they're going to change the way that our whole global economy functions. Because when you get right down to it, the global economy, and by that I mean the ability to produce something at one end of the world to be sold at the other end of the world, yes, it's about finding the cheapest labor force, about moving your factory to where the wage rate is lowest, or even better, getting out of the factory business altogether and buying whatever your old factory used to produce from some sweatshop halfway across the world. What that implies, however, is the ability to move things around the world at relatively low or marginal costs. And no matter how we move things, whether we move things by air, by boat, by train, or by truck, there's only one fuel that we burn, and that's oil. Transport costs are a footnote, a tertiary cost in a world of $20 a barrel. But all of a sudden, in a world of triple digit oil prices, distance costs money. So much so that it will dramatically redefine economic geography. The very same economic forces that paved over our farmland 30 to 40 years ago, that hollowed out our industrial sector and sent all those factories halfway around the world, those very same forces will actually act in reverse in a world of triple digit oil prices as in a world of $20 oil prices. 
Because what we'll find in so many cases, everything from furniture to producing steel to producing machinery, is to move your factory to some low-wage market in China is going to be penny wise and pound foolish. Because what you will save in labor costs, you will more than squander in bunker fuel. Of course, the world of triple-digit oil prices is not a world that most people expect to occur. We've seen it. But of course, it's been rationalized as some flu, some speculative bubble. But in fact, our brief flirtation with triple digit oil prices has nothing to do with the bubble. The banking crisis was the bubble. Our glimpse of triple digit oil prices is the inexorable consequence of where world demand and world supply is going. And one of the reasons that economists have been so behind the curve when it comes to predicting oil prices is that the behavior of oil contradicts some of the most fundamental assumptions that we have in economics. The first one being the upward sloping supply curve, which is just a fancy way of saying that the higher the price of something, the more of it will be supplied. After the OPEC oil shocks, that's exactly what happened. Higher oil prices raise new cheap supply from places like the North Sea and Freehold Bay and broke OPEC stranglehold over the oil market. And that's what economists and the oil industry was telling you for the last seven to eight years was going to happen this time around. But this time around, there's no more North Sea. There's no more Crudo Bay. Canadian oil sands are the Crudo Bay of today. You know, the Canadian oil sands, or tar sands as they really are, is not a new resource. Tar sands have been known back in 1920, there was a pilot project to develop synthetic oil out of tar sands. What's new is the notion that the tar sands could ever be a commercially viable source of oil supply, let alone what it is today, which in the eyes of the International Energy Agency is the single largest source of future supply. And that's not because of anything that's changed in the tar sands. That's because of what's happened to conventional supply. You know, you don't hear this, you certainly hear huge discoveries like the Tiber Field down six and a half miles below the ocean floor of the Gulf of Mexico containing so-called 1.2 billion barrels of unproven reserves. You hear a lot about that, but what you never hear is this, that the world loses about 4 million barrels a day every year to depletion. Now, the world consumes about 85 to 86 million barrels, so that's like roughly 4 to 5% a year. What that means is that by 2014, we're going to have to find another 20 million barrels a day, just so that in 2014, we can consume the same as we're consuming now, let alone any room for world demand. And what we lose every year in those 4 million barrels a day, what we lose is the light Arab sweet crude the low-cost conventional fuel. And what we replace it with is fuel five to six miles below the ocean floor, or asphalt-type fuels found in tar sand.